We are going to do this in English because uh, um, uh, the entire project is in English and, and not everybody speaks German among us. So this is going to be an English presentation. I'm very happy to be here. This project actually started on the 1st of May, almost exactly half a year ago. And our aim today is just to look back on the first six months uh, and present to you what we have come up so far with and what we plan to work on over the coming years. We will start with some information on the idea and the background of the project and then say something about us and what, what, what got us to do what we're doing now. Um, we will then give an overview of what we mean with the term Highland Asia, our research area, and the topics and themes as we see, that we see as a common ground. This will be followed by uh, a more concrete outline of some of the research activities and collaborative projects on the way, and a note or two on the methodological approaches with which we are experimenting. We will conclude this talk with some remarks on how we hope to engage with the department, with you here and now. First to the background idea and the project. Like most projects, this one has many, many, many beginnings. One of them took place here, where I found the seed of the idea that finally led to a topic, a proposal, and, a, and finally a grant. As many here will know, my main area of research are the Himalayas. And my doctorate, um, after my doctorate, I pursued a, a project called Neighboring China, which was concerned with the question how China's rise affects the people living directly along its borders. Many of the border regions around China, they share a similar history. They were once zones of contact and extensive exchange, and they became peripheries at the very margin of nation states um, during the 1950s and 60s. And over the past 10, 15 years, a period of opening up began in which many of the old pathways of exchange saw an astounding revival. This is an improvised trading camp in northwestern Nepal, about five to six days walking from the nearest airport in uh, Simikot, in, in, in Humla. It's a very clearly a remote place, but sitting in these tents over endless cups of tea and, and Chinese brandy, you hear all these stories. One man telling how he started smuggling mobile phones from, from China via Hong Kong uh, and Bhutan to India. Or another guy who actually lived in one of these tents and, and was an old friend of mine who was dealing with, with, uh, with his brother's meditation center in New York and, and, and his brother's new wife and the fallout all of this created for the family back home. In short, this may be a very remote place, yes, but it is also an utterly connected one. I'm tempted to say it's a cosmopolitan one. How to make sense of these remote yet cosmopolitan notes in the high mountains of Asia? This is the question that kept puzzling me over the past few years. And it led to the, the issue we seek to address, namely the relations between remoteness and connectivity. These remote yet connected highland areas in Asia are of great geopolitical concern. What happens at the afghan tajik border in Kashmir, in Tibet or northeast India has a global impact crisscrossed by the fragile borders of rising powers and rich in natural resources, a multitude of stakes and analytical positions are attached to these frontiers. They figure as sanctuaries for insurgents, as realms of authentic tribal culture, as trafficking routes for, dr for drugs and wildlife parts, or simply as rural peripheries in need of development. Public imaginaries like this oscillate between these simplic simplistic assessments and policymakers struggle to comprehend the dynamics involved. Local communities continue thus to feel misunderstood. <clears throat> what is missing is a conceptual framework that captures the entanglements between these assessments and these cases. Addressing this challenge is the primary concern of our project. In most media reports, but also actually in the majority of academic work that is undergirded by the classical monographs of the region, remoteness is generally assumed to be the defining condition. The rugged highlands of Asia, they are considered backward, authentic, or unruly because, for better or worse, they are isolated and far away from developed urban centers and state control. However, state-of-the-art research on circulation and mobility also shows that connectivity with the outside world is an essential feature of livelihood strategies in all remote areas around the globe. They frequently find themselves at the crossroads of intensive exchange of natural resources, of labor, of capital, of manufactured goods. Migrants, smugglers, and saints pass through. 
Geologists, tourists, NGOs, reporters and missionaries come here to look for resources, for opportunities and for target groups. Highland Asian livelihoods are shaped as much by connectivity as they are by remoteness. Our starting hypothesis, then, is a very simple one. Remoteness and connectivity are not two independent features. They constitute each other in particular ways. The primary objective of this pro project is to explore this nexus of remoteness and connectivity, as we call it. This serves a double purpose. First, we hope to gain a better understanding of Highland Asia in the world. And second, we seek to lay the groundwork, the conceptual groundwork, for a new apprehension of the role and position of rem remote areas around the globe in general. So, with this idea, I developed a proposal and applied for a so-called starting grant at the European Research Council, the, the ERC. Unlike most other European funding schemes, the ERC does not look for direct social impact to solve one of the challenging problems of Europe today. No, it funds basic research that addresses a novel question, or maybe in this case rather an old question from a new angle. It is a competitive funding scheme, but once a panel of around 20 professors from all over Europe decide that what you're doing is, is, is worth being supported, the ERC starting grant provides generous funding for five years and a lot of freedom. And the grant allow, allows me to approach the question that keeps puzzling me as a team of researchers. Which brings me to the next point in our outline, namely our research team. Including me, we are a team of four, the three of us here and one who is of officially joining us next year. However, we had the opportuni opportunity to meet this summer in Ladakh to begin thinking about what we want to, how we want to work together. And as some of you will know, I have this, I have this background in theatre. And one thing that I always missed in academia is this energy that comes from, from working closely together as a team on a project. And I hope that this project gives me the chance to, to, to go there again, to, 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 to experience this again. Thus, we put a lot of effort into developing new ways of collaboration and go beyond what I have so far, so far experienced in anthropology. So should you see us arguing with each other in the corridors over the past, over the coming years, that's probably a direct result of this, of this effort to, to work together more closely. We are planning a total of 52 months of field work, split between the four of us. Um, as all of us will have a primary field location, but the plan is also to visit each other and to spend um, uh, stretches of overlapping and collaborative field research in order to make sure that we, we are not just a little bit familiar with the research contexts of the others, but, but rather more so. Uh, we are also designing methods to work together during analysis and also for publications afterwards. With Radhika, in front, who will join us next year, for whom we are actually recording this session because she can't be here to, uh, today, and who has not formally authorized the use of this picture. Sorry, Radhika. Um, with Radhika, I studied together at, at Oxford. She is a senior postdoc at the moment at, uh, in Göttingen, and she will join us in, in April. Alessandro and Caroline I met in 2013. Alessandro at the end of the Ramadan in the only open cafe in Kashgar and Caroline a few weeks later uh, in Khorok, Tajikistan, where she was just beginning her master's research. While this photograph marks another beginning, namely, so to say, the beginning of our collaboration, there were, of course, earlier beginnings for all of us, beginnings that set in motion stories which finally brought us here. These stories start in Rovereto, in Gerzig and in Hundwil. So a very famous passage from uh, the Taoist classic, the Tao Te Ching, um, says that a journey of a thousand miles uh, begins with a single step. Well, in my case, this journey began in Rovereto, in northern Italy, and took me to China, where I first studied Mandarin in Beijing, and later on conducted research in China's westernmost province, in Xinjiang. Uh, my PhD project, in particular, was an in-depth study of China-Pakistan cross-border interactions through an ethnographic analysis of the Karakoram Highway, which is the only road connecting the two countries. Based on fieldwork, which took place across multiple sites in both countries, my thesis included the analysis of various uh, case studies, such as the Uyghur community of Pakistan, uh, the activities of Pakistani cross-border traders, Chinese road workers in Pakistan, and so on. For this project, on the other hand, I focus on another border region, Yunnan, in the south of China. 
Many of the issues that I aim to analyze are quite similar to my previous work in Xinjiang, such as cross-border trade, infrastructures, the development of minority region, and large-scale plans of transnational connectivity. And so despite the different setting, I find uh, many continuities in both my academic interest, uh, my academic biography, and my personal history. I am originally from uh, uh, an autonomous border regions in the Alps. Uh, I did my PhD in Aberdeen, close to the famous Scottish islands, and did most of my research in one of China's most remote, culturally diverse, and least populated regions, Xinjiang. So many of the themes at the core of this project, uh, from remoteness to connectivity, development and transnationality, have been with me since uh, long before I began my studies in anthropology. <coughs> So, the village where I grew up, pronounced Jürzig, by the way, it's not Gürzig. It's written Gürzig, but it's Jürzig, in the local dialect, is located amidst the vast cash crop plains of central South Saxony Anhalt, formerly a part of the GDR and since 1990, integral part of the Federal Republic of Germany. Well, as the crow flies, Jürzig is about 4,800 uh, 4, kilometers away from the Wakhan Valley in Tajikistan and Afghanistan where I conducted research for my master thesis and where I will return to for my PhD project. Apart from the geographical distance, in many different respects, it has been a long way for me to reach there. And it wasn't a straight one either, as I was rather meandering here and there um, before I found the pathway leading to this remote yet connected place. I first tried my luck in India during my bachelor's studies. Um, Sorry, uh, during my bachelor's studies uh, and spent six months in Patna, Bihar in 2009 and 10, which finally led me to the conclusion that this is not quite the place for me. In 2012, I had the great opportunity to spend half a year um, in different places in Pakistan, finally ending up in Chitral in the northwest of the country. Against the background of my flatland origin, I was taken away by this um, high altitude scenery and even more so by the, people, by the people inhabiting it. Yet, bothered by security officials and unsighted by stories about other researchers' nightmares, I decided against doing fieldwork in Pakistan for my master's studies. Then, wondering where to turn to instead, my supervisor at the University of Tübingen suggested to have a look northwards across the Hindu Kush. There be a country called Tajikistan and a mountain area called the Pamirs, which I've never heard of before, so I had to look it up on the map. To be honest, initially I wasn't really thrilled to spend extensive lifetime in a former Soviet Socialist Republic. I credit this reflex of defense to my biased upbringing. However, in March 2013, I found myself standing in a kindergarten in Ishkashim, a village town at the entrance of the Wakhan Valley, and being totally struck by the impression that I have seen that place before, as it resembled so much of my own kindergarten experiences back in GDR times and 4,800 kilometers away in the present. This is how the field found me, rather than the other way around. My subsequent MA thesis is an attempt to understand social and moral dynamics underlying Ishkashim inhabitants' um, habit to go shopping without paying instantly, but rather running into debt. This is where I come from, Hundwil. Hundwil is a village in the canton of Appenzell in eastern Switzerland. It's a dairy region with a green monoculture of juicy grass with no other flowers than the old dandelion in May. I grew up in that grey house on the right. In some ways, I experienced remoteness in Hundwil as well. That, that there was no public transport after 8.30 in the evening and, and, and uh, there was really not much to do. Thus, my interest for the world out there in general and my interest for, for the Himalayas and, and Central Asia in particular came from reading. National Geographics, for example. I remember this, this article, this, this, uh, this piece by Eric Valli on the honey hunters of Nepal, which was instrumental for my first idea of Nepal. Or that book, A Day in the Life of the Soviet Union, um, made by 300 international photographers who were granted access for one day in the late 1980s to the Soviet Union and brought back images so different from, from those we had in our minds of the Red Square and the, the military parades. <coughs> 
But my way from Hunwil, where cows get a medal when they produce 100,000 kg of milk in their lifetime, from these hills of eastern Switzerland to the mountains of Asia was not a straight way at all. I spent my 20s working with handicapped adults as a gardener, as a carpenter, and in the stained glass workshop of my uncle. I earned money as a designer, and I worked in theatre, first as an actor and later as a stage director. And after an, an arts crisis at the age of 27, I started studying anthropology and began travelling in Asia. First for my MA to Siberia, to Buryatia, and then later uh, to Tibet and to the valleys and plains of the Himalayas and the Pamirs. Thus, I switched field sites twice, which, is certainly, which certainly comes at a cost but it also led to an interest in comparison and a wish to understand these places in the highlands of Asia, not just from their idiosyncratic local histories, but also, and not just from, from the perspective of globalization or their inclusion in a global sphere, but from the multitude of their entanglements with each other and with the wider world. So we would now like to give you a very brief overview of the area um, we are working in and some of the common themes that run through our different projects. This project proposes Highland Asia as shorthand for the terrain of inquiry it is concerned with. As defined for the purpose of this project, Highland Asia includes the areas along Asia's highest mountain ranges from the Pamirs to the eastern Himalayas. The purpose of selecting this region is not to identify distinctive cultural or sociopolitical traits, but rather to serve as a vehicle for the study of relations and processes that otherwise remain out of sight. And so our chosen field sites are not only transnational, but also at the juncture of, tra of the traditionally scholarly boundaries of area studies, Central and South Asia, China and Southeast Asia, and so on. Highland Asia transcends these boundaries and offers a vantage point that facilitates new understandings of the myriad of local contexts, their interrelations and their ties to the wider world. At the eastern edge of Highland Asia, the Yunnan-Myanmar border area where I will conduct my research is a place of seemingly great contradictions. On the one hand, or perhaps I should say on the one side of the border, we have China's growing economy with its brand new roads, its impressive border gates, uh, and its well-armed military personnel. We also have a range of policies aimed at protecting the local environment, such as a ban on logging and slash and burn cultivations and to develop uh, Yunnan's growing tourist industry through the, through the institution of natural parks, minority villages, and cultural festivals. On the other side of the border, we have what is it often referred to as one of the last lawless regions in Asia, Myanmar's Shan and Kachin state, where a number of rebel armies still oppose the central government and rule over large territories. At the center of various illicit traffics, those areas still seem to fall within James Scott's famous Zomia paradigm. Within this setting, there are different, often competing narratives at work. There is, on one side, a strong developmentalist discourse calling for more government interventions, for more infrastructural development, for the creation of special economic zones. At the same time, Chinese companies are still very much involved in illegal and environmentally destructive resource extraction businesses in northern Myanmar, uh, particularly jade, gold, and timber, as you can see in this picture. Um, in the proximity of the border, there are also a number of casino towns crowded with Chinese gamblers. Those places are often hubs for various illicit traffics, drugs, wildlife, human beings. The China-Myanmar border, then, is a place of complex and often conflicting trajectories, my aim, through a number of case studies, is to disentangle some of those trajectories and gain an understanding of the role and position of those seemingly remote areas for both China and Southeast Asia, as well as their relations with the wider world. So from the very eastern end of Highland Asia, we now turn to its very western end, and that is to the place of my own fieldwork in the Wakhan Valley at the border between Tajikistan and Afghanistan. So, talking about a valley naturally implies to talk about a river. And as a natural feature, the Panj River, which you can see in the picture, uh, divides the Wakhan Valley into halves running along fields of subsistence crop and dusty roads that link settlements on either side. In the annual flood season, the Panj threatens to wash away the annual 
um, these very roads and those houses built too close to its riverbanks. <coughs> Yet, as a political device of border demarcation, the Panch River divides the valley and thus the life of its inhabitants into two separate spheres of national integration, Tajikistan and Afghanistan, respectively. The divide dates back to the time of the Great Game, when the Tsarist and British empires were fighting for spheres of influence, and it was considered to be reasonable to keep these rivals apart from each other by creating a buffer, a, a buffer zone that became known as the Wuhan Corridor. As a result, history and way of life took divergent paths on both sides of the river. On the Tajik side, people witnessed the integration into the Soviet Union and the subsequent fundamental reorganization of their lives according to Soviet schemes. In contrast, their relatives living on the Afghan side remained, until recently at least, rather unaffected by both the state and wars. While the border wasn't continuously as hermetically sealed as Soviet officials wished for, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, new and legal opportunities to bridge the divide opened up and materialized mainly in the shape of cross of cross-border trade and movement. Yet, the divergent historical trajectories of the two sides continue to shape life accordingly. Tajiks turn to Russia in order to make a living based on remittances, while Afghans rely more on subsistence farming and herding and send comparatively few family members abroad or to Kabul in order to make money. However, people on both sides share a dependency on traded goods that are brought in from distant markets by outside outside traders who connect their Wuhan clients to international trading networks and consumer product chains. Moreover, both Afghans and Tajiks became targets and or beneficiaries of development schemes, for example, rising the potential for tourism, which indeed increased the number of adventurous <coughs> tourists, but also brought flush toilets where there is no plumbing. Well, not much plumbing in the high valleys of northern Nepal as well. Over the past few years, and now for this project, I've focused on, on two regions along the border between Nepal and Tibet. In the west, the, the Kailash area and, in the, and the Humla district of northern Nepal, and in the east, the Kanchanchanga area, and particularly the upper Tamo Valley and the Taplichung district of Nepal. Both are areas where trade between Nepal and Tibet was once the main source of income and where trade has recently seen a stark revival. The train lines to Tibet and Xinjiang on the Chinese side and, and, and fervent road construction in the, in the Tibet autonomous region have led to a situation in which several Chinese roads now reach Nepal, the Nepal borders from the north, while roads that would link these high valleys with the rest of Nepal are still missing in many places. Thus, access to these areas from the north is much easier than from the south. And combined with a relatively liberal border regime, trade and exchange with China has once more become a crucial factor in the livelihoods and ambitions of people. Much of what is consumed in northern Nepal these days, from alcohol to food, from clothes to shoes, kitchen utensils, from torchlights to solar panels, now comes directly across the border from Tibet. This situation and the, opportunity, the opportunities it affords are driven by a stark asymmetry. China's rapid development and omnipresent state here, Nepal's political chaos and widespread feeling of underdevelopment despite 40 years of international aid and cooperation there. This is a highly volatile situation and it is not clear what is going to happen here. Currently, several road corridors are being built on the Nepal side as well, and with better infrastructure, larger players, logistics companies, and so, and so on, they are moving in. And also the state is rebuilding its presence along the route, these routes as well. Much of it was lost during the civil war in Nepal, the, the Maoist um, People's War. But at the same time, the border... The remoter border crossings, they, they remain remote and they also profit from their remoteness, so to say. In an era of global trade and international e efforts at regulating with uh, laws like CITES and, and, and things like that, in this era there is this, this demand for, for uh, uh, borders that are more porous and more flexible. And that's exactly uh, what what creates many of these opportunities for trading things that may be not exactly legal, but, uh, but have really channeled many, many dreams and ambitions in, in, in the northern parts of Nepal these days. Um, thus, with these remote crossings, 
becoming more important again, uh, the mainly Tibetan-speaking population of the northern valleys of Nepal once again assumes this classical role as, as brokers or mediators between two worlds. Uh, young, ambitious people uh, coming, coming, are coming back to make use of these opportunities. They sometimes leave their jobs in Kathmandu or come back from abroad to, uh, to start a business up here. And in some regions, the prices for mules, they have tripled over the past few years as a result of this boom in trade. Remoteness and connectivity are enmeshed here in a particular way, and this is exactly what I'm trying to understand in my research. As it is clear from these brief introductions to our field sites, they raise a variety of topics and themes. And as Martin has emphasized before, we wish to engage in truly collaborative work with each other. One important strategy to pursue this aim is to develop a common stream of thought, that is, to jointly identify basic themes which are relevant in various degrees, though, for all of our field contacts. We took the first step to create such a common stream of thoughts during our boot camp in a hotel in Ladakh in North India this summer, where we occupied the dining hall and jotted down uh, themes on sheets of paper and discussed the linkages and relevance as we spread them out on tables. These ideas, themes, and topics evolved in the conversations we entered in throughout our joint field workshop, which can, you can see here on this slide. However, this is and remains um, work in progress for the entire time span of the project. Still, the aim for this collective work on common topics and themes is not confined to keeping all of us on the track, to defining research questions, guiding fieldwork activities, designing research me methods, and so on. Rather, informed by our diverse ethnographic studies, we hope to eventually produce a new theoretical perspective on the ways remoteness and connectivity are entangled. With this in mind, we would like to present now a brief overview of some of the projects and research activities we are working on. This project called, um, called Roads of Memory is concerned with the question of how the construction of new roads and the active process of remembering important events of the past play together in defining the role and position of Yunnan's borderlands in modern China. In development rhetoric, road construction is often seen as an essential precondition for socio-economic development. Since the very beginning of the, re the, of the reform period in the early 1980s, China has fully embraced this view and to this day new projects are charged with expectations for future prosperity and accordingly promoted by local and national authorities. This future-oriented view of roads, however, is often linked to memories of former connectivity. The China-Myanmar borderlands are populated by an incredible variety of national minorities with idiosyncratic transnational histories and cultures. This area was also one of the main theaters in the anti-Japanese and anti-British wars, historical moments that play a fundamental role in the definition of modern China. Many of the roads and development projects currently planned in this area are thus strictly connected, at least in the official rhetoric, with either the turbulent history of the early 20th century or the traditional lives of local minority groups. Accordingly, the aim of this project is to analyze this particular connection between history and development. Roads here are intended as one of the main agents of Chinese development and are particularly relevant as they often seem to raise emotional responses, both in terms of expectations, but also, at times, opposition. The concept of memory, on the other hand, includes a combination of different processes of heritage making, historical branding, uh, and rediscovery of traditional practices. The primary objective is precisely to explore this entanglement between history and the particular ways in which history can be interpreted, selected, and exploited. Uh, and a particular form of Chinese development in the border areas of Yunnan, and so gaining a better understanding of the role uh, of history in the definition of China's future and its impact on the local communities along the China-Myanmar border. This project, um, entitled <coughs> Moving In, Moving Up, Moving Out, uh, I started together with a, a friend and, and fellow anthropologists, 
from, from Nepal, Nima Dorji Bhutia, this summer. It is concerned with tracing the mobile lives of the people of Walong in the upper Tamo Valley, eastern Nepal. It addresses the question how physical mobility continues to be linked with social mobility. Until the late 1950s, Walung was a major trading hub situated near the Tibetan border on an important trade route across the Himalayas. The prosperity of the village was directly tied to the mobility of goods and people passing through. After the so-called democratic reforms in Tibet in 1959 and the border demarcation between Tibet and the People's Republic of China in the early 1960s, the role of Walung as entrepot declined and people started moving out, some to Hile and Taplijung, others to Darjeeling and Kathmandu. Walung, however, was never deserted. Other families from nearby villages moved into the abandoned houses and those who had left of those who had left and trade with Tibet continued, although with different goods and on a lesser scale. Still today, people move in, move up and move out. Studying this dynamic of social and physical mobility in the context of a rural yet non-subsistence-oriented community provides a perspective on migration in the highlands of Asia that has so far not, re not received much attention. Our primary objective is to, to establish a collection of interviews and recorded conversations with a variety of people from Walung. Nima, a young anthropologist and historian who is actually from Walung itself, is carrying out uh, oral history interviews in Kathmandu, in Darjeeling and in Taplichung. He's right now in Walung actually. While I will do the same thing with the sizable population of Walunga in, in, in the US, mainly in New York. Um. Though I am still working on the research design of my PhD project, I would like to briefly sketch some of the um, ideas and fields of inquiry that have evolved so far. First, I'd like to take up the importance of movement and mobility in Martin's example on Wallung. Thus, movement and mobility, as well as the absences, are also central features of life in the Wakhan Valley. The two roads on either side of the Panj River connect infrastructurally remote places to urban and trading centers and thus ensure the movement of people and necessary goods. Yet people and things do not flow unhampered on either side. A seat in a, ta in a Tajik shared jeep or in an Afghan Opel Astra costs a considerable amount of money, rendering shopping in distant markets where goods are cheaper, more expensive than buying commodities for considerably higher prices from truck traders that rumble up that rumble up the valley. Apart from transport expenses, which may also render a visit to the dentist unaffordable, gendered possibilities of mobility represent another dimension of connection and disconnection. Thus, who is mobile and for what reason, and who is not? The constant move of Tajiks seeking work in Russia points to yet another, a transnational dimension of movement and connection. Here, people and money flow in opposite directions the latter accompanied by consumer goods which origin elsewhere and thus redirect, redirect incoming remittance money back to unknown producers. Here, remoteness represents a positionality vis-à-vis -vis national industrial production, international markets of labor and commodities, a positionality that allows few local traders to connect to international commodity chains and to gain profit, financed by workers abroad. What are the modalities of these connections and who benefits and who pays? Here, wider, implication, wider implications of absent husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, agricultural labor force also get into view, as do aspirations of entrepreneurial individuals and young married women who dream of leaving their in-law's house and living abroad. Looking at the collaboration of the state and development agencies provides a further field of inquiry. The well-intentioned introduction of the weekly cross-border market at Ishkashim aimed at the elevation of poverty and at safeguarding livelihoods in winter months when many areas are cut off from market centers. While Taji clients benefit from previously inaccessible or unaffordable commodities, local Afghan, Afghans soon found themselves displaced by traders from outside the region with whom they could not compete. In addition, outsiders did not confine their trading activities to the cross-border market, but came to dominate the local bazaar as well and, as a consequence, started to settle permanently in Sultan Ishkashim, which causes a variety of conflicts. 
these short glimpses into livelihoods in the Wakhan Valley hint at the complex entanglement of places that are imagined as well as made remote, with connections that reach far. We also work in on a, a number of collaborative projects, not only among us, but uh, trying to involve other scholars from different regions and different institutions. <coughs> so, for instance, with Martin, we are now trying to we are, try, we are now developing a, a project on the so-called uh, socialist new villages. Uh, first, as a proposal for the next AAS conference in 2016, and then hopefully as a workshop and edited volume. During our previous research in China, we both encountered those socialist new villages. In short, um, the villages are part of the so-called Building a New Socialist Countryside program, which was launched by the Chinese government in 2006 with the aim of modernizing the countryside through commercialized agriculture, urbanization, and infrastructure development. As part of the program in recent years, many peasant and nomad communities have been resettled into newly built socialist villages. Yet despite our experiences in different parts of the country, uh, we both didn't realize the scale and pervasiveness of the project until we traveled to the Dulong Valley this May, a remote corner of Yunnan where all of the local population has been resettled into the new villages, and such as this one, um, over the past three years. Here the modernist project connected with the villages is well visible in the physical outline of the villages. They're built in straight lines, uh, along roads, and around a central building for community activities. They reflect a certain aesthetic paradigm. The red flags that generally flap on rooftops, as well as the posters of Xi Jinping and Mao Zedong that often adorn the entrance of the houses, are a visualization of the party's role in the development of the countryside. Our aim, then, is to initially take stock of scholarly work on the topic, identify uh, further trajectories of research, and eventually uh, produce a first attempt to comprehensively understand what is currently going on in the Chinese countryside. Another collaborative endeavor is an exhibition project called Highland Flotsam, where we want to bring in our passion for photography and collecting things. The project idea rests on the observation that contrary to popular stereotypes of remote and isolated mountain areas, many of the places of Highland Asia have been right at the center of global connections for a very long time. And as people move in, move out, and move through, they leave things and stories behind. Our aim is to tap into these material and narrative sediments with a method that we call archaeology of the contemporary. Rather than collecting the last remains of an imagined distant primordial past and bring them to European museums, we want to collect simple things, things we call flotsam, things with, with a cosmopolitan biography, things we put into context with our cameras and questions. And all this we want to bring back here and present in a special exhibition format where the focus lies on collected objects and their visual contextualization via large format prints. And all this, <laughs> sorry, that is a mistake of the text. However, um, the uh, juxtaposition of object and image open a space of thought. For example, an industrial product, the two super cola cans you can see here in the Tajik tea house, were produced with pride in Herat in Afghanistan and thus imported from Afghanistan to Tajikistan. How do they get there? Where are we and what is the role and position of this little mountainous place in the wider world? What we want to tell is not the story of remote places as being displaced by globalization, modernity, and development. What we want to render visible and palpable is the texture of remoteness and connectivity, which we consider to be the key to gain a less stereotypical understanding of life in Highland Asia. Closely linked to this Highland Flotsam or, the, or Strandgut am Berg project is a particular methodological approach we are trying to employ and develop. We call it, as Caroline mentioned, an archaeology of the contemporary. This is not our term, I'm afraid, but it is a very good one to describe a particular sensibility to the stories of objects, of, of, of material sediments left behind. In the highlands, where there is no weekly garbage collection and where the climate is often dry and cold, stuff stays. 
waiting to be reused one day. Things form layers of sediment, so to say, which often serve as a catalyzer for stories and for memories. These Chinese army biscuit tins, for example, they're a testimony to, to times of hardship in the 1960s and 1970s when the borders were already demarcated, but the People's Liberation Army in Tibet was still dependent, at least to a certain extent, on grain and provisions brought across the border from Nepal. All these oil barrels you see in so many places in Ladakh Left behind by the, by the army, these barrels are sediments of the ongoing territorial disputes between India, Pakistan and China. What is now considered the traditional Ladakhi art of making iron stoves developed in the 1970s as a result of the sudden abundance of sheet metal in the area from these oil barrels. As many of the huge, and many of the huge prayer wheels uh, you find in, in, in Buddhist parts of Ladakh everywhere, they're actually made of these barrels as well. Once fueling, in a very literal sense, the militarization of Ladakh, they now turn to spread Buddhist mantras for peace. An archaeology of the contemporary aims at following up the lives of things behind these contexts and their role in making this nexus of remoteness and connectivity. A second methodological experiment is what we call um, co-itinerant ethnography. During my PhD research along uh, the Karakoram Highway, I carried out what is today uh, generally known as multi-sided ethnography. As we all know very well, um, for a long time the dominant approach in ethnography was to choose a village and stay put until one started to understand what was actually going on. This approach tends to foreground religious festivals, the agricultural cycle of the year, mm -hmm. local politics and the twist of kinship and marriage. However, it is arguably less suited to the study of goods and people on the move. Multi-sided ethnography has been suggested as a way to break out of uh, the confines of the local and study phenomena that cannot be accounted for by focusing on a single location, such as migration, transnational family ties, uh, or, as in my case, cross-border trade. This certainly makes sense when studying networks and flows. However, a multi-sided approach is less suited to capture the social realities along pathways, the bundled connections that form the arteries of exchange in Highland Asia. And so we find that gaining an adequate insight into life along a pathway requires a methodological approach that follows actors and goods. The researcher needs to practice what we call a form of participant co-itinerancy, to gain a better understanding of the role of pathways in the nexus of remoteness and connectivity. Experience from our previous research strongly suggests that accompanying people on the move yields different insights than stationary research at one of the nodes of a network, such as a market or a border crossing. A co-itinerant approach is able to capture the stories, the rumors, obstacles and fears that condition connectivity. It is capable of tracing the maneuvering that constantly takes take place along the way. Co-itinerant ethnography and an archaeology of the contemporary are, of course, not the only methods we employ, but there are two approaches we want to experiment with. And in 2017, when the bulk of our field research is behind us, we are planning a workshop here at LMU to, uh, to reflect on these and maybe other new, new methodological approaches in our discipline. This brings me to the last point uh, of this presentation, namely the ways we seek to engage with the department here, with the staff and students, with you. So one way of engaging is a contemporary anthropology reading group in short CARC. This is a monthly reading group organized by us and open to staff, PhD students and tutors of the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology. The focus lies on monographs of contemporary anthropology, loosely linked to the themes of the Highland Asia project, but without any commitment to a particular region. Reading events will take place monthly, starting with the first meeting on November 27. Another way to engage with not only the members of the staff, but also the students of the department is uh, through teaching. Martin is currently teaching a reading course on the work of uh, Tim Ingle, whose intellectual project has had a significant impact on our own research and it has proven very productive as something to think with for some of the concepts and themes 
that we aim to explore in this project. I, on the other hand, will be offering a course on the uh, introduction to the anthropology of China during the next summer semester, which aims at providing students with a comprehensive and multidimensional uh, understanding of contemporary China and of many uh, of the issues that the country is facing, as well as a, an overview of the most recent studies and debates on the subject. Our hopes, then, is to reach out through those various initiatives um, and establish creative connections within uh, the people working and studying uh, at the department here. Last but not least, we finally, finally, finally launched our website today. And much of what we said, plus quite a bit more, is actually, can actually be found at, at um, highlandasia.net. So now we have bombarded you with a, a plethora of things we are working on and planning to work on. Uh, this was brief and broad, and perhaps it's raising more questions than it answers. Partly this is also our intention, namely to lay out this potpourri of, of work in progress in order to facilitate conversations and potential areas of common interest. In, if any of this resonates with your own work or with plans for future research, please do approach us. We are very happy to be here and we hope that this is the beginning of many conversations here and now, later in the pub and over the coming years. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.